the, the safety feature that you seem sleepy. I mean, if I just use time alone, say, oh, you've been driving for four hours, you probably need a nap, right? That could easily go wrong. But the minute I can tell you're dozing off and I can do something else that's a bit more intelligent, then it really resonates with users. Welcome back to 10 Minutes On. Today's topic focuses on the shift from passive voice assistants that wait for you in the background to features that are more proactive, that do things for you. And one place where this shift is particularly noteworthy is in the car. And today we have Adam Enfield from Sirens, and he's here to discuss how automakers and drivers are embracing proactive voice assistant features and how this segment is evolving. Adam Enfield, welcome to 10 Minutes On. Hey, Brett. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. So tell me about this thesis that Sirens developed around proactive voice assistants and how this is really leading to a paradigm shift about the way people think about and use voice assistants while driving. Yeah, I mean, if you look back at the history of voice assistants, you've watched this evolution that went from something where you would simply say something and it would do it, to one where it would respond to you, to one where it might ask a follow-up question. And there's been that evolution where it's been more and more capable from kind of a command and control to something that was more of an actual assistant. And what we're seeing now is this shift where people have gone from this initial opinion of, well, don't just come out of nowhere and talk to me, to going, well, you know what, actually, maybe there's a place for that. And we're seeing more and more as we talk to people and we explore the space that people are actually not even just kind of okay with this, but there's certain areas where they even expect it. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. And I think, you know, just to emphasize this point, I think this image is like a perfect example. We had this idea that the driver could ask a question. And as you said, there's actually a multiple evolutions of this. So the first was command and control. The second was some sort of interactive, maybe multi-step, multi-turn conversation, depending on how complex or the interaction was, uh, to this idea of moving into a number of different use cases, which I think are really interesting around a mix of reactive and proactive use cases. So maybe share with me some of the use cases. What is a proactive use case in the car? Well, I mean, and I'll frame this before I give you a specific use case around the thought of it not just being an assistant anymore, but actually like a co-pilot. If you think about the cockpit here, we're thinking about how someone next to you might do more for you both when you ask them or proactively when they see an opportunity to do that. So some of the examples here you might come up with, the ones that are resonating the most with people are things that have to do with safety. And I'll actually point to one of my earliest studies in this space, looking at what would happen if you're about to be in a collision and the car is doing something, in this case, we'll say reading a text message to you, and it detects that's happening, where it can do something like play an alarm, stop the message, let the driver kind of take a deep breath and recuperate and they go, all right, you know, let's, let's try that again. Um, and if you start looking at anything with safety or the maintenance and well-being of a car, people for quite a while have started to go, okay, this is more and more of what I expect. But where you're seeing even more of a shift now is where, well, wait a minute, what about the things that are more about my entertainment or my comfort or making my drive more convenient? And that's where you're seeing things more along the lines of where you would uh, offer to adjust the temperature in the car because you notice them shivering or notice that the temperature is just colder than you know that this person typically keeps it. Or when you know a bit about their day and you want to help them plan their route a little bit better so they can accomplish everything they want. So there's a whole whole bunch of different opportunities we have here where we can see the assistants can actually be more like that, that co-pilot and offer to do things first instead of wait to be asked to do it. I love that co-pilot idea. And, and as a co-pilot, if you think about it, sometimes you're asking the co-pilot to assist you. And sometimes the co-pilot is taking action on, on their own, or they're at least asserting that maybe some action should be taken. And I like this graphic that you provided as, as a way to explain the evolution to me. And so you see some of those, some of those reactive voice assistant features in there. I think there's that show up in the blue, like turn on the headlights, please unlock the car. Those are things that we're asking the voice assistant to do. And that's maybe the more traditional version of voice assistants in the car. And then you have some of those things that are, I guess, violetish pink, where it might be responding to you. And then you've got these magenta ones where it's, it is being really proactive. So, 
you know, you, your battery's low. This is something that I would love for a car to tell me because I've been stranded a couple of times. There's a siren detected, so you might need to be alert. Maybe you haven't heard the ambulance yet and you need to get out of the way, clear traffic, or be aware that some other drivers might be doing that, right? Because they may notice it before you. And then this other thing I saw in here, which I think is really fascinating, I believe you demonstrated this to me at CES in 2019, is you seem sleepy. And so that's like a combination of the eye tracking capability plus the assistant capabilities coming together for like a really novel safety solution. Yeah. And here's part of what's changed a lot since even 2019 or before that. If you think about the reasons why people were initially in our studies, for example, hesitant to have this proactive assistant, they were worried about the timing. They were worried you wouldn't know enough about what was going on, enough about me as an individual driver to get it right. And now we're at a point where there's so much opportunity to monitor the drivers with the driver monitoring systems that are, are mandated in Carson to the just usage history to what else they're doing and things you can permission to share such that you're able to do things like that and find the right time to do it in a way that's, that's much more acceptable. And again, back to the, the safety feature that you seem sleepy. I mean, if I just use time alone, say, oh, you've been driving for four hours, you probably need a nap, right? That could easily go wrong. But the minute I can tell you're dozing off and I can do something else that's a bit more intelligent, then it really resonates with users. You know, I think of these different states that we have, and you're a UX researcher, you had a UX for these products, it's your end. And I think you probably have an interesting take on this. So you have the idea of the car, the voice system can help you control the car and there's certain functions within the car where that can be much better because maybe you're more distracted if you're hitting a touch screen to try to do that. There's something about the driver's preferences that could be reactive or proactive from an assistant. And you're talking about this idea of sleepy being the state of the driver. And then there's also this whole other thing that is, I think, been kind of revolutionary. It's the outside the car. So the context of the driver is something we've never seen before, or is, I should say is very new. And this concept of outside the car services as well, which increasingly are enhancing the driving experience. Could you break that down as a UX user experience leader? You know, how do you think about that? Because there's a significant behavioral and adoption shift that is taking place around this. Sure. Um, and I think that the, the foundation of what this means from a UX perspective starts with that, again, back to the term we used earlier, a paradigm shift. The idea that it's not just choosing a couple select use cases that might work, but rethinking the way that an assistant, or in this case, the co-pilot is there for you for, throughout that experience. And I'll pick on EV charging for a moment. As we move to more and more cars being electric, the need to charge it, the way you drive, that's all different than most of us have gotten used to with uh, ICE vehicles, with gas vehicles. And if you start to think around all the ways you might help someone optimize, not just when they're going to go charge, but use information about the environment to make sure that they get to their destination with the right level of charge, you suddenly end up with these more complex scenarios that end up resulting in these better outcomes. So if I'm someone who never lets my battery get below 25%, and I know it's cold outside, and I know that the drag is gonna be higher on the interstate because of the weather, and I know all these things, I can bring that together to go, you know what, all I have to do is propose that I have someone take a slightly different route to charge up at this place for X number of moments or, or minutes or, or hours, whatever it may need to be, to be able to get to that right outcome. And that is a complete shift where you start to actually be able to depend on this. The user starts to expect these behaviors. And as long as you're getting those inputs right, making the right predictions, and you learn how to correct them when you're wrong to do better next time, it allows users to entirely rethink about the role of these assistants in their cars and, and in other places as well. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to start to think about that. And then from a user standpoint, I have this sense that the users are ready for this now, but there haven't been that many automakers to deploy it. And some of that is just the lag between the technology being available and when the new platforms come out from the auto brands. Tell me a little bit about when we should expect to start seeing more of these features in some of the leading auto brands. And there's a good chance you'll start to see more and more of them on the road about next year. And it depends on how rich you're talking about. The richer ones will come later. But it's something that you know users really have opened up to. Automakers have a lot of great ideas. A lot of great brainstorming sessions have happened in a way that 
it, it's it's possible. The right data is there, the right inputs are there, the right technology is there, and it's being built today. So it's something that's starting, you know, probably early to mid next year. Um, you start to see like the the first flavors of this, and it'll get more and more intelligent as we go on from there. Okay, so what are some of the first features that you expect us to see in the cabin on the road? So the safety and the maintenance ones are definitely the case. So anything, again, that comes down to, I gave a few examples with crash avoidance, but even for the well-being of the car, instead of just a check engine light when you have something come up, if you have something that's critically wrong with your engine, I think you're going to see some of those things start to come pretty quick where it lets you know, hey, you need to pull over right now and call a shop. I think that if you really look at those two categories, those are the ones that are, I guess, uh, puns partially intended, the safest bets to go for here. And the ones that we know require the least calibration because those are bigger deals to the users. What about the services that are just modern day conveniences? So for example, automatically reserving me a parking spot and then auto calculating, knowing my, my calendar, how long it will probably take me to go from the parking spot to where my meeting is. Yeah, the minute you get past the safety maintenance, that's really where the power is. If you can help people avoid traffic or resolve parking issues, there's a lot of good opportunity there that people really don't like to have to do themselves. And in the moment, parking is a wonderful example that even if you know that garage you usually go to usually has a spot, what if you're running 10 minutes late or you're leaving 45 minutes earlier than usual? The ability to actually be able to not make you have to think about that to be able to know I have all those inputs that you referenced together and be able to get that parking spot reserved for you and guide you right to it. That's where people really start to see this power beyond just the safety, but into where it really makes their lives more convenient. So that should we expect it a couple years, three years, where, where do you predict this will, those types of services, those pure convenience services will start to pop up for consumers? You're t- talking closer to about two years for that type of thing here. And again, it's going to vary a little bit, right? Uh, but for the most part, I think that's you'll start to see those things within the next two years. Adam Enfield, voice assistance in the car is co-pilots. It's a new world. Thanks for joining us. How can people learn more about what Serence is doing in this space? So you can uh, check us out on serence.com, our website. We also have a pretty good presence on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn for those who are uh, in, in this discipline and in this area as well. So you can find out more through all those places. All right. Glad that you were able to come out today and let us know what the future of voice assistants are in the car. Thanks so much, Brett. Hey, VoiceBot Nation, thanks for being back here once again. Please like and subscribe to this channel. We really appreciate it. It'll help us out with YouTube's algorithm, and it'll help you too.